Well, it feels eerily apropos that I accidentally styled my hair like a sister wife today um, because um, today I'm going to read um, the rewrite that I did of um, William Faulkner's A Rose for Emily, which I've rewritten for remedial millennials as a short story called A Flower for That Bitch. So here is A Flower for That Bitch by Miriam Gerba and William Faulkner. When Emily Grierson died, everybody and their mother went to her memorial service or celebration of life. The men went kind of respectfully. The women went because they were dying to see what that dead bitch's house looked like inside. Nobody but an old Mexican type dude, a man that gardened and cooked, had set foot in her place for at least 10 years. Emily had lived in a big house house that started out as white as an Amish virgin soul. Fancy architectural stuff, swirls and cones and swirly twirly things, gave her mansion a wedding cake look, and since it didn't get taken care of properly, the thing eventually rotted on what used to be the street where all those who believed their shit didn't stink shitted delusionally. This street came to be molested by a process called ghettofication, and it turned into a somewhat ratchet place. This ratchetivity chased away all the rich assholes who'd once bragged about living there. Only Emily had stayed behind. Her house looks hella torn up now, but even without squinting, you can see the ghost of how it used to be awesome. You can see the ghost of how it belonged to very important people. With Emily dead, the house belonged to no one, and it sure as shit wasn't passed down to the Mexican-type dude who had done everything for Emily in her final years. Emily didn't go that way. Her dead body now mingled with the rest of the dead bodies in the cemetery, and in its haunted soil, this graveyard holds soldiers who fought on all sides of our civil war. This was our great war against people owning people. Back when Emily had been alive, she'd been a real charity case, and our town's old school people hadn't minded taking care of her. The welfare they gave her went all the way back to 1894 when the mayor, Colonel Sartoris, I'll call him KFC, although I could just as easily call him KKK, he never got over his side losing the war, announced Emily did not have to pay taxes. KFC claimed Emily's dad had loaned money to the town and that it was so much that our way of paying him back was by letting Emily live tax-free. Hmm. The story sounded fake to all of us, but if you want badly enough for something to be true, you'll rearrange a lot of furniture in your head to believe it. That must be what Emily did. She convinced herself she was one special bitch. A bitch with a capital every letter. As the old school people croaked and the newer, fresher generation took over, they came to see Emily's free ride as totally unfair. That bitch ought to pay her fair share, they believed. So, one year, when it got time for the tax people to print up the bills, guess who they also printed one up for? That's right, Emily. They mailed that bitch her bill and waited for her to pay. Her February due date came around. Her check did not. The tax guys wrote Emily a letter telling her to come to the police station when she had a minute, but she never showed up. A week later, the mayor himself wrote her a letter saying that he could give her a ride or something, but in reply, a spooky envelope arrived at his office. The mayor fingered it open and slid out a note written in creepy old-timey handwriting. It said, I never leave my house. The note's author included the tax bill with it. This felt like an F.U. City officials called a special meeting to figure out what to do about Emily, and soon after, a bunch of them showed up at her mossy front door. No visitors had passed through its doorway since Emily had quit giving crochet lessons about eight years earlier. The men's knocking summoned the Mexican-type dude, and he let them in and led them through a birth canal of a hallway which flowed into a bereft and menopausal stairway, vagina with cobwebs. The Mexican-type dude brought them into a sitting area. Its big-ass leather-covered pieces of furniture intimidated the visitors, and as the Mexican-type dude pulled open the blinds and the confused light gave the visitors a better view, they could see that the furniture was ripe for the thrift shop. Despite their feelings of intimidation, the men did sit. Mute dust coughed from the creases and folds in chairs and sofas. A metallic stand by the fireplace supported a crayon sketch of Emily's dad. His hand-drawn eyes observed the disturbed particles swirling in the light. As if she was the national anthem, the men rose as that bitch entered. Her body balanced being petite with being plus size, and Emily had swaddled her paradoxical figure in a black dress topped with a skinny gold chain that went all the way to her waist and disappeared into her belt. You could tell Emily's skeleton was too small for a woman of her metaphysical stature. Her flesh was too much raw biscuit dough stretching over it. There was something rather dead and rotten about this dough, too, 
lifeless and lost, damned by peculiar natural processes, pale. Her eyes were having a tough time in their face, competing with its unhappy lard, and they peered out from under a masculine brow, moving from one man's face to another's. In some, Emily looked like Kathy Bates, circa 2013. Emily allowed the men to remain standing. Standing by the door, she stared them down. Their spokesman rambled a bit about taxes until he gave up and shut his lipless mouth. In the quiet, all heard the unseen watch at the end of Emily's chain, reminding them of time. Emily's voice was beyond bitch. Dry, cold, godlike. I don't have any taxes in Jefferson, she spoke. KFC explained it to me. Maybe one of you can examine the city records to gain a better understanding of my uniqueness. We have, insisted the spokesman. We are authorities, Miss Grierson. Didn't you get a notice from the sheriff? Yes, said Emily. He's mistaken. I have no taxes in Jefferson. But talk to KFC. KFC had been dead for ten years. I have no taxes in Jefferson. Jose! The Mexican type dude appeared. Show them out. So the bitch got the better of them, just like she'd gotten the better of their dads thirty years before about the aroma. That was two years after her dad had died and a little bit after this guy she'd been into, the guy we thought she'd marry. Mary dumped her. After her dad died, she hardly went out. After she got dumped, she gave the bird to civilization. A few women had the guts to try to visit her, but nobody ever answered their knocks, and the only way you could tell anyone was living at Emily's was that the Mexican-type dude could sometimes be seen coming and going with reusable shopping bags. A man can't do the kitchen all by himself, even if he is a person of color, the neighbor ladies gossiped. These broads got their I told you so moment once the aroma blossomed. This aroma was so aromatic that it made many a local asshole wonder whether or not their shit stink too. Emily's house smells funny, one neighbor lady complained to the mayor. What do you want me to do about it, he replied. Tell her she needs to fix it. That's odor pollution. Ah, uh, it's probably just some possum that Mexican type dude killed and forgot to bake into an enchilada. The next day, two more people complained and the mayor took one of these complaints seriously. It came from someone with a penis. Look, said the man, I want to bother that weirdo as much as you do, but we've got to do something about that rotten mango crossed with skunk juice stench. That night, Several volunteers, three older guys and a bro, a dude so young he hadn't owned slaves, met. It's easy, said the bro. We'll write her a letter telling her she has a week to get rid of the smell, and then if she doesn't, for fuck's sake, groaned the mayor, you seriously think I want to sign a letter saying P.S. you stink? Being pussies, the men decided to go about odor eliminating the sneaky way. The next night, after midnight, four trespassers crept onto Emily's lawn. They tiptoed around her yard like youth on a toilet papering mission, sniffing along the edge of her house and around the cellar. One creeper carried a Santa slack slung over his cold shoulder and reaching in, he tossed something onto the ground over and over and over and over and over. Imagine that he was feeding ghost chickens, invisible chickens, imaginary chickens, chickens that can do anything because they're not real, chickens that can fly to Argentina for the winter. With a crowbar, another guy busted open the cellar door and the two others reached into the sack and tossed, spreading buttloads of lime everywhere. In case you don't know about lime having this ability, it's an odor eater. As the guys scampered away from the house, none of them noticed the figure that had appeared in a room that had been dark. The window framed the shape's lamp-lit silhouette, which sat super erect and super motionless and dark as the moon during a satanic eclipse. The crew finished scuttling across the crabgrass and headed into the street. After the same length of time it takes to recover from the common cold, the aroma vanished. People finally started feeling a little sorry for Emily around this time, and people like having pity parties for other people. It makes them feel glad that such a party isn't being thrown for them. Everybody did wonder how nuts Emily would eventually go, considering how nuts her great aunt went, attacking people with her false teeth, continually having to be talked down from the flagpole, and people also wondered why with such mental health issues in their DNA did the Gertsons think they were the shit. Emily never went out with any of the local guys who were considered the guys to date, and Emily and her dad were so dramatic, we kind of saw them as not real. We saw them instead as a reality show. Emily, the skinny chicken white, stuck on that big ass house's porch, her mean ass dad running around the yard with a whip, cracking it at bushes where he believed the guys who'd come to do his only daughter were hiding. Once Emily turned the big 3-0 and was still in the market, people felt truly smug. It was like, look, what more proof do you want that you're not all that? Your family is nuts, which means you'll go nuts, and everybody can smell how nutty your peanut butter is turning. Nobody will ever want to stick his banana in that jar. 
When the biggest banana in Emily's life, her dad, died, it got around that the only thing he left her was that stupid huge house he practically held her captive in. I gotta admit, people got off on that. They could finally acknowledge in their heads and hearts that she was a pathetic beast. Single and poor, she fell to normal human lady status. She was one of us. Now she'd learn what it was like to have to eat leftovers. The day after her dad died, all the women prepared to go visit her and say how sorry they were and offer her help, which is what we do around here when somebody dies. Emily met these assholes at her door wearing a regular dress and not sad at all. The woman explained why they were there, but she said in a valley girl accent, my dad's totally not dead, and shut the door. She did that every time somebody came over, the priests, the doctors, everybody who came to tell her that her dad was definitely dead and that with the warm, moist weather, it was time to get him out of the house. They almost had to send in the SWAT team to get the body, but as they surrounded her house, Emily accepted reality, let some good-looking undertakers in, and they got him into the ground that afternoon.